In August of 2022, President Biden announced a plan to provide some student loan debt relief. That plan has since been struck down by the Supreme Court. So what does that mean for people with student loans? That's next on WNIN Newsmakers. Repayment on student loans is scheduled to resume on October 1st. Here to discuss the end of the student loan pause is IU's Director of Financial Literacy, Phil Schumann. Thank you so much for being with us today. So Absolutely, what, a pleasure being here. So what happened to the planned forgiveness of student loans? So uh, it, the plan forgiveness for student loans, uh, it got challenged uh, by a couple of different parties. It went to the Supreme Court and they ended up deciding that or ended up ruling that it wasn't legal. And so therefore, what the Biden administration put in place uh, to have students, you know, have some of their loans forgiven, either $10,000 or $20,000, depending on whether or not they were a Pell recipient or not. Uh, they determined that it wasn't a legal thing for the Biden administration to do. And so therefore, uh, the plan got put in place where come October 1st, students are going to or students or recent graduates are going to have to uh, start making repayments on their student loans. So I assume the October 1st deadline is a hard, fast deadline. I mean, is there going to be any wiggle room on that? There's uh, there has been some talk about there could be a little bit of wiggle room just in terms of whether or not servicers are going to report people from being delinquent on their payments. Um, but it's a hard and fast rule, basically, that payments are going to start at this time. But ultimately, if students are having or if people are having trouble making their repayments, the first thing they should do is just contact their loan servicer immediately and just figure out what options they have at that point. So can you explain the SAVE program? I mean, how is it different from previous income-based repayment programs? So the SAVE plan is a little bit different just because it's using, um, it's, it's requiring people to have, uh, to put forward less of their discretionary income uh, towards the student loan repayments. It also has a term where uh, if for, for undergrad loans, after 20 years of those like uh, smaller payments, the balance will be forgiven. If it's grad loans, it's 25 years as well. And that discretionary income, what used to be you know, 10% or 15% is now going to be 5% for undergraduate loans. And so this is basically just putting people in the position where they're going to be required to make smaller payments in order to meet the like, minimum requirements uh, for what their, whatever their monthly loan payment is. Um, and there are some other terms as well that are sort of based differently on how, how, yeah, how your household is. You know, if you filed married, married separately, um, anything along those lines, there's just a lot of different things that are happening that could make it so that families have uh, less of a financial burden as the result of their, uh, their student loans. So they're not necessarily going straight back to the payment that they were making before the forgiveness. So they would need to contact their loan servicer and just make sure that they qualify for that right. safe plan. But it's possible that, you know, whatever plan they had prior to all of the loan pause and all of that, it could change as a result of this safe plan being implemented. Okay. Were there any groups that did receive loan forgiveness? I mean, there have been some groups that have received loan forgiveness, certainly not to, this, uh, to the full extent that the Biden administration had originally planned, uh, but they have been mindful about reaching out to different parties as a result of, you know, a good faith, I'm just gonna say like, as a blanket statement, like a good faith effort to make uh, their payments. They found that some people may have qualified for public service loan forgiveness who weren't being, or their payments weren't being counted as part of it. So they've actually done a pretty good job of going back in and making sure that everybody who should have qualified for a loan forgiveness plan or for loan forgiveness under whatever plan they were under did actually have that happen. And that continues to happen even uh, in spite of the fact that this you know blanket uh, loan forgiveness program didn't get approved. What about, are there any plans to expand the forgiveness to other groups? Not that we know of right now. Uh, you know, the big one that still remains to this day is the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, which has been in place uh, since the Obama administration, um, actually maybe in a little bit earlier, but it's been around for, you know, now 15 years or so. 
And so that one still is, is a good one for people who are going to the public service sector looking for a way to have their loans forgiven after 10 years of public service. So, you know, for teachers working in municipal fields, for people like myself who work in higher ed, just a lot of different nonprofit organizations, um, you know, if people stick around for 10 years um, and have some sort of income uh, based repayment plan associated with their payments or with their student loans, then they might qualify for that public service loan forgiveness. So that still is in place and we still tell people to look into that if they think they qualify. What about, you know, I know the loan forgiveness plan was going on, but weren't there some people who probably still paid on their loans during that period or did everybody just kind of stop during that? So people certainly could make payments during uh, during this loan pause. It was just, it was never required that people had to do it. Um, and so theoretically speaking, for those families who had the financial means in order to pay off their student loans, there was never a cheaper time to do it because the interest wasn't accruing and you weren't required to make a payment. So you could just throw money towards your debt um, and, and potentially have that go away. And so now, you know, they might be in better shape as this uh, is the pause uh, lifts. Mm -hmm. But for those families who are struggling, who couldn't make those payments, you know, it, it was a nice period of time where they didn't have to feel that financial burden. Um, and they could sort of get their feet set, hopefully, during that time. And now that we're coming back to this repayment, hopefully they're in better financial shape that, you know, having to make these repayments isn't going to be as much of a burden as it once was. So is there a place for people to where they can find all the information about this and um, that they need about student loans? The thing that, the thing that people should do uh, first step in this process, if they're not sure who their loan servicer is or how much they have in student debt or anything along those lines, they should go to studentaid.gov and they should just view their dashboard. Uh, it'll have all the information about their loans, who their servicers are. They should make sure as well that their contact information is correct because if their servicer is trying to reach out to them, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that your contact information is up to date, certainly because if you haven't interacted with them in the last few years, maybe they don't know, you know where you live and, and what's going on in your life at that point. And the other thing you should be doing when you go in there is reviewing each loan, reviewing the balance, the interest that's accrued on it, the interest rates, and again, that loan servicer. And just make sure you have all of that information ready to go as you start having to making these payments again come October 1st. So really, it kind of falls on the person, though, to make, make sure that they're taking care of this, right? I mean, are they just going to get a letter in the mail saying, hey, your payments are starting again? <laughs> I mean, their their loan servicer is required to send them a billing statement at least 21 days before the payment is due. But I still would put, you know, I, I would still tell any borrower, you need to go into your uh, into your profile and just make sure that everything is up to date and you're in good shape, um, just because that's going to be the way to keep to keep you safe during this entire process. And the, and the other thing I'll say, too, is like if people set up like auto payment as part of this they do receive a i believe it's for every loan servicer but they receive a uh, 0.25 percent rate discount um on their student loans so that's just a nice way to like, have a little bit of the interest that's cu uh, cut off on their loan payments okay well thank you so much this was good information yeah absolutely i'm happy to help and uh, anytime you need anything else feel free to reach out okay Here to talk about financial planning for higher education is Kim Wren, a financial advisor for Berger Wealth Services. Thank you so much for being here. Nice to see you again. Good to see you, April. So what are some of the ways parents can plan financially for their kids' education? Right, so probably the most popular way that parents say for higher education is the 529 plan. Um, and through the state of Indiana, we have a program called 529 College Choice. Um, that way parents can put after-tax dollars into basically an investment account for their kids, let it grow in the stock market and bond market over time, and then when it comes time for them to start using those funds for college or any sort of higher education, um, they can take all that money out tax-free. So there's a lot of tax advantages to, to saving that way versus just putting it in a, in a savings account. And is this something, you know, I think people sometimes panic because they think, oh, I didn't start when they were born. Right. And so they, is this something they could really do anytime? At any time, absolutely. So uh, obviously the earlier the better, as with anything. Sure. But if you find yourself in a situation where your kids are in high school um, or you're just a few years out, it's never too late to start saving. There's no requirement for money to stay in a 529 plan for a certain amount of time before you start using it. So you could, 
you know, if you get gifts for, at graduation for your kids even, you know, it might make sense to even just funnel that money as cash through a 529 plan for the tax advantages in a lot of situations. What about somebody who's older and thinking about going back to school? I mean, what, what would you suggest to them as far as paying for their college? Right. <laughs> no, that's a trickier situation. But um, people, uh, you know, people going back to school can open 529 plans for themselves. Mm -hmm. So you can open a 529 with yourself as the beneficiary. If, if it makes sense, it doesn't make sense in all kind of tax situations. That's one of those consult your tax advisor um, scenarios, but you can save money for yourself if you know you're gonna be going back for graduate school or an advanced certificate, something like that. It could make a lot of sense to, to save that way. And again, the advantage is you're allowing that money to grow inside the account. And the difference between what you put in in the beginning and what you take out after when it's grown in the market, that difference is tax free. Oh, so that's so it really for someone older, it might be more of like you were saying, I think I'm gonna go back to school maybe in five years. Right. Something like that. Exactly. exactly. Not necessarily I'm going back to school next month. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes in those situations, if it's a more immediate need, sometimes it makes the most sense to just cash flow it if you've got the cash to do it. Um, or maybe borrow a little bit and 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 pay it back later. Um, but if you have time and you can anticipate saving and giving it time to grow in the market, um, you know, in a lot of cases, using the tax advantage 529 plan just makes sense. What, how do students and parents look at their options? Well, you know, if they, if they do think they're going to have to take out a loan, what should right. they be thinking about or looking at? Sure. Every parent needs to take a moment to decide what do we as a family want to be able to do for our kids. Some parents um, are very committed to the idea of fully funding all of their kids' education from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Some parents take the approach of we want to fund half and we want the student to have some skin in the game and so we want them to work some, maybe take out some loans in their own name. So the baseline is decide what your philosophy is as parents about education funding uh, and then you can back into your options from, from there. Usually some combination of parents or grandparents having saved up and having some, some, some money set aside and things like 529 plans or custodial accounts. Some, the, 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 the student is working and, and in some other cases, uh, they're taking out their own loans and sometimes the parents join them in that too through the Parent PLUS loan program. So let's talk about some of the things people who do have student loans mm -hmm. can do to prepare for their payments restarting because they've yes. been kind of woohoo. I know. <laughs> it's, student loans have been on pause for three years now. Right, right. Um, and what's interesting is there's a class, there's a cohort of graduates <laughs> who have gotten their degrees, they have student loans, they're in the workforce, but they haven't had to start They've paying yet. They've never had to pay. They've never had to pay, oh, at least to date. Right. So that's, a, that's gonna be a, um, <laughs> an interesting awakening uh, next month when, when repayments start. So the first piece of advice I like to give people is as much of a pain as it might, might be, you have to know where you stand. So you need to find those logins, you've gotta open the mail, you've gotta look at the statement, know what your balances are, know what interest rate you're gonna be charged. Um, so just take a thorough assessment of where you stand as far as your student loans. Then you can start the research process. If you're in a position where that payment is gonna be unfeasible for you and your family, look into your repayment options. There's a program um, that went into effect this summer called the SAVE program that instead of just taking the balance and dividing it by 120 payments, which is the traditional repayment program, is a 10-year kind of payoff program. The SAVE program allows for uh, borrowers for their monthly payment to be calculated based on your income and your family size. So it's gonna protect more of your monthly income for things like your rent, your food, your transportation, um, instead of so much of it, a percentage of it having to go out to student loan payments. So definitely do research on your repayment options. So it doesn't necessarily have to be set in stone. Correct. It, it might be not, I, uh, I don't necessarily want to use the word negotiate, but it is something you can. Right, there, there are options out there. Now there's different income qualifications. Every program's a little bit different. So you'll need to contact your, your loan service mm -hmm. provider to really see what you qualify for. Um, also keep in mind, if you work in the public sector, uh, cer certain government programs and certain nonprofits, um, it, it, through the, the public service repayment program, if you make consistent payments for those 120 payments for those 10 years, um, oftentimes those loans can also be forgiven. Uh, at the end of that 10 year per period, the balance can be, can be wiped away. 
Um, now there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of regulations, there's a lot of qualifications that you have to make sure that you are diligent about qualifying mm -hmm. for that program for all 10 years, um, not missing a payment, you know, staying on top of things. Um, but that's also a great option for relief for, for uh, borrowers who need that. So we're going to go back to talking about older people again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they still, that still have, and they might have st some student debt all right. still. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things they should know? Absolutely. To begin? So probably the biggest warning to give those, uh, the older generation who still have student debt is a lot of people don't realize if you take student loans into retirement uh, and you, those loans go into default, they can be deducted from your social security benefit. Really? Right. So your social security benefit can be reduced by the amount that you owe for student loans if you're taking student loans into retirement. So something to be very cautious about and a priority to balance between retirement, reducing your income, you know, it, paying off the home, all sorts of other things that you're balancing in retirement. So um, if there's something to be prioritized, it's probably working down that student loan balance um, so, so that you're not um, going to put other forms of income in, in jeopardy like your social security. I didn't even occur to me that they right. would be, so they are going to get your they, their money. It's, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have any other advice about higher education costs in general? Right. It's, it's one of those things where, um, uh, un unfortunately, uh, education costs just tend to rise faster than other forms of, uh, other cost of living, other daily costs of living. So it's just something that people have to plan for. Calculate what you need. Um, be careful about, or be, be very intentional about where you choose to get your education, because that'll make a big difference on the final kind of outcomes too. Going to a state school versus an out-of-state school, going public versus private. Um, you know, a lot of people are, are, uh, are taking um, their kind of basic education works at local colleges and technical colleges and then transferring into maybe more expensive state schools or private schools for the mm -hmm. rest of their specialty education to, to lower those costs. So something that there's lots of options out there, there's a lot of ways to fund education and lots of ways to make education as affordable as possible. Um, unfortunately, probably not gonna get significantly cheaper in the near future, so just think ahead, plan ahead, and know your options. But there's not much that gets cheaper I as, know. as time goes I, on, I know. unfortunately. Absolutely. I, but your, to your point, community colleges, mm -hmm. and you know, another one is the military. Military, fantastic option. Yeah, that's fantastic a great option. way to get your education paid for. It really and get is. great training. It so. really is. Okay, well thank you so much for being here with, it, with us today. Good to Thanks, see April. you. Thanks, April. Because of the need for specific positions needing to be filled, some educational programs are eligible for free post-secondary classes. Here to talk about that is Sarah Worstel, Executive Director for the Southwest Indiana Workforce Board. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Now, can you tell me a little bit about the Next Level program? Yes, Next Level Jobs. Um, there are two paths within the Next Level Jobs program. One is Workforce Ready Grant. And that is one of the programs that individuals would be able to earn college credit or even a post-secondary credential at no cost. There are a few uh, eligibility criteria for that program. Um, one first being an Indiana resident, so this is exclusive to mm -hmm. Hoosiers, um, but also be a US citizen or an eligible non-citizen um, with no previous college degree. So it's really focusing on those individuals that are coming out of high school, um, earning their first, earning towards their first degree, or even adults that are uh, in the workforce that are looking for a post-secondary credential. So they could already have maybe some college courses under their belt, just not a degree, Correct. is that what you're saying? Okay. Yes. And it doesn't matter where those were from? I mean, it, it doesn't have to be Indiana specific? It does not. Okay. <laughs> um, there are certain eligible uh, post-secondary providers that are eligible for the Workforce Ready Grant. Um, that can include Ivy Tech, Vincent's University, and there's a few other um, private organizations that are eligible. But it does have to be ex uh, an uh, award as post-secondary credential in high growth industry sectors. So that can include IT, business services, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, 
um, and, a, and several others that would be eligible for that program. And then where are these courses? Are they online? Are, you, are they going somewhere to take them? Or? That's really the beauty of the Workforce Ready Grant Program. It is uh, based on the individual, whether they would like to attend in person or even online certification programs. It's up to them, so it's at their at their discretion. Well, where would they go? I mean, is it at the workforce office? I mean, where are they? Online, you can mm -hmm. register online mm -hmm. to um, designate what industry you're interested in, um, where you would like to attend, and how you would like to attend. So that is nextleveljobs.org. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how did this come about? having this program? So this was a program uh, from the legislature and Governor Holcomb's office. Um, this is something that um, really assists Hoosiers in higher earning power. So having that post-secondary credential, whether it is a degree program or even a short-term certification, really boosts earning power. Well, what are some of the programs that people, I know you mentioned IT earlier, uh -huh. but. Welding, um, there's certified driver's license, the CDL program, um, welding, uh, CNA, phlebotomy, um, and then there's also a variety of IT certifications as well. So I can only assume that this was probably also something that the, um, the, the manufacturers wanted or people who are needing to fill these jobs perhaps? Yes. I Yes, so it does help with job placement, and that is one of the major focuses of our Work One Southwest offices is job placement and preparing individuals for employment, whether they need a post-secondary uh, credential or just some pretty simple assistance in gaining employment. So what are, are there other programs that are cost-effective for post-secondary uh, education? Yeah, uh, there's certainly military um, trade unions offer an incredible opportunity for work-based learning and uh, also attending post-secondary and earning a degree. Um, but there's also employer-sponsored programs. Um, you can talk with wherever you're working to see if there's tuition reimbursement um, and really have that assistance to set you on a good path. And what we talked about, I mean, we've talked about with other segments on this show is talking about the military as being such a good opportunity for people to to get that. I mean, so that would be talking about people who are younger. What about older people? Can they take advantage of this program also? Absolutely. Yes, there is no age restriction on the Workforce Ready Grant. Um, it does have the other criteria, but there is no age limitation. And certainly with um, trade union and employer-sponsored degree programs, those are all eligibility uh, exclusive. So if somebody wants to do this, I know you mentioned going to the, the website, <laughs> um, but, um, what are they going to have to have to, do, to qualify for this? Yeah, so they will fill out the FAFSA, um, and then they will also have to connect with the post-secondary institution. Once they sign up on the website, the post-secondary institution that they have identified would be in contact with them. And who are the, some of the post-secondary um, institutions that are involved in this? Uh, Ivy Tech, VU, Vincent's University, and there is the Indiana Tech organization as well. So this sounds like a great opportunity for people. Yes, especially to kind of launch that early career, mm -hmm. um, get into the workforce, get a credential, and increase your earning power. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you so much for being here and talking about this. Thank you. If you're still in high school, several local school corporations offer dual credit classes through USI and Ivy Tech, as well as AP classes, which can all help reduce the overall cost of post-secondary education. Thanks again to all of our guests for explaining the finances of higher education. Next week, we'll be learning about a recent IU genetic study about pain and brain communication that could change how we treat alcohol abuse disorders. Thanks for watching WNIN Newsmakers.